great welcome to this live session by justice project pakistan on policing without torture my name is ajaz haider and i will be moderating the session uh, policing is delicate business uh, there's a reason i say this because when we talk about police excesses in order to understand them and police excesses can be defined in terms of abuse of authority brutality torture it is important to put the concept of policing itself in the context of the modern state and its control of the population now essentially police at the basic level comprises a body of officers who represent a government civil authority so in other words police are responsible for maintaining internal public order and safety now this function typically requires enforcing the law and preventing detecting and investigating criminal activities so police essentially is a coin with one end marked as service and the other as enforcement now service to the law abiding citizen in a state whose life and property must be protected against unlawful and or violent acts and enforcement of law against those who break it there are several different policing models in the world in pakistan we have had a number of debates on how to reorganize and reform the police the most ambitious to date was the 2002 police order and that didn't really survive the departure of general parvez musharraf even though and i this is a point that i need to note it was penned by three very experienced and respected police officers um inspector generals afzal shegri zulfikar qureshi and shuaib sadr this evening we will focus on the issue of police torture though it should be fairly evident that minimizing eradicating and criminalizing torture are all related to reforming the police itself but given the focus on torture we shall be parsimonious uh a word about the fact that you know the jpp uh, launched a national public engagement campaign to reach out to vulnerable communities students and stakeholders in order to build consensus and garner support for criminalizing torture in pakistan jpp has also hosted panels at reputed universities engaged transgender activists and also marched to bring awareness and criminalize torture against women This evening is part of that awareness campaign but it is also special because I am joined for this session by two serving police service of Pakistan officers Muhammad Asan Yunus who is currently inspector general of the Federal Capital Police IG Yunus has extensive experience of urban and rural policing I also have with me senior superintendent police Maria Tamur who served as district police officer Patpatan and in that capacity has a solid field experience of policing SSP Tamur is also a regular contributor to Dawn on policing matters. I must thank both our guest officers for taking the time out for this discussion. I must also thank Muhammad Ali Nekukara, another very fine police officer, for helping us put together this panel. He could not join this discussion because of personal engagement. So let's dive right into our discussion. And uh, I've given the, the the introduction in English, but we could always uh, have a mix of urdu and english uh, will also i'm assuming since this is going live on facebook you probably have questions also uh, so essentially it's going to be about 40 45 minutes for this and uh, we'll have about 20 to 25 uh, minutes of questions uh, that i'll ask the panel and then of course if you've got questions from the viewers uh, we will be happy to share them with our panelists uh so thank you so much uh, let me uh, begin with uh, ig yunus uh so ig yunus uh, the, there's uh, you know pakistan is, is a signatory to a number of conventions that require domestic laws to be brought in conformity with those multilateral agreements those conventions so give me your sense as a police officer of why you think it's important uh that the issue of torture uh needs to have some salience uh not just for the sake of uh the people that interface with the police but also for police's own efficient work and its own image ha uh, bismillah arrahman arrahim sir thank you very much for giving us um, this opportunity to talk about torture and uh, because 
unfortunately torture and policing perhaps it is not but are always uh, talk together that is uh, a problematic issue because uh, uh, it is perhaps uh, it is an accepted thing that police will always resort to torture to uh, for any of uh, its uh, uh, legal ambit and unfortunately sometimes illegal ambits to my understanding there are uh, four types of torture uh, which uh, we see in our policing overall first of all it's the most common that investigation during the investigation an accused is tortured for confession or during him for any other information second is uh, a torture on the behest of somebody some influential uh, to like uh, put their uh, agendas third is sometimes a torture or a, a, a violence which we see during public assemblies with people where people our police resort to lack of charge or baton charge or something and last uh, there is a torture in attitude as well so these are the, to me it has like four types of torture which uh, police uh, does and we see it. number of reasons we behind it first of all obviously we do understand that there is a lack of professionalism and there is a lack of good investigation techniques where you know people are not uh, well prepared to uh, conduct an interrogation and obviously workload over an environment and to get the things early is perhaps are the other factors which contribute to uh, immediate torture uh, other and during the investigations while uh, not defending it but uh, it's also important that uh, not talking it will also not yield no results yes torture has been uh, a part of uh, overall police working but if you could see in last two years I suppose 2020, uh, when we had a number of uh, torture-related deaths by police, like the Salahuddin case and other cases, uh, Alhamdulillah, there is a, a clear decline which we are seeing in uh, such custodial deaths. And at the very same time, uh, policing is now getting itself uh, uh, with the new modern techniques and now every investigating officer almost other at least the second one which, uh, which i experienced uh have do has the capacity to collect the data before interrogation or at least to like uh, uh, they, they they try to confront the accused with their preparation they uh, we are saying that it's in uh, a phase of uh, developing so but it's essential for future of policing it's essential for Overall, or police image, it's essential for public trust that um, such transition is also evident from overall working and uh, it is displayed in such a manner that people tend to believe that, sir. Right, right. Uh, very interesting points. Before I get to uh, the organizational models uh, that we have uh, and also some other nuances. Let me pull in uh, SSP Taimur here. Uh, SSP Taimur, you have written a lot about uh, police reforms. Uh, you have also talked about the gender element. Uh, I just want to quickly, before we get into certain specifics, I want to get your overall take um, as uh, not just a police officer, but also as a female police officer with reference to, uh, and, and you know, as I said in my introduction, you've also been uh, the district police officer in Park Patan, so you've got a field experience. We will also get to uh, the sort of differences between urban and rural policing, but give me your initial uh, uh, assessment of how you look at this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, the problem of torture and the fact that we do need to have legislation that criminalizes it. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Jasa, for giving me uh, this opportunity to speak on a very important topic. Um, and um, I, I think it is absolutely the, the right time to talk about uh, this issue of uh, uh, criminalizing the torture, because <clears throat> first of all, we must understand that uh, the different uh, types of uh, torture, like uh, were the IG Islamabad, he has outlined. We must go back to the roots of what is causing it or what uh, are the reasons behind the torture and what sort of models of policing are we um, following here in Pakistan. Um, basically, we have to differentiate the sort of policing which uh, has a history of uh, colonization that is absolutely different from uh, a police which was always independent because there is always more room uh, for um, revolutionizing the police and even uh, evolving into a better service uh, delivery mechanism if uh, you have not been colonized earlier. So I think that uh, if you go back to the root causes, this becomes uh, one of the main reasons why the police reforms uh, have had their setbacks and challenges in being implemented. And um, uh, right now we are still grappling with a lot of issues related to police reforms. Uh, secondly, I must say that uh, as a female officer, this uh, the use of excessive force um, basically is something that uh, globally research has shown that uh, wherever you uh, put in uh, females in law enforcement, they tend to use, uh, they are likely to use uh, less force. Uh, they also do not in, indulge in excessive use of force. They always resort to dialogue, interventions, mediation, and uh, uh, such mechanisms which will try to mitigate uh, the conflicting situation. So I think that once we go into the details of what are the alternate mechanisms actually available to eradicate torture from the policing methods, I think it is absolutely necessary to understand that there are effective mechanisms available uh, for modern uh, policing uh, in the modern policing scenarios where we can actually come up with some alternate mechanisms and put them into our standard operating procedures so that uh, we do a better job at what we do. Right. Excellent. So. Uh, let's get to a uh, couple of other things. Um, I.G. Yunus also talked about something very important, which has always uh, made me wonder. Uh, whenever there's a high profile case um, and there's a lot of public pressure, it also brings a lot of political pressure on the police in terms of trying to resolve this, in terms of trying to get hold of people, in terms of, you know, the entire process of investigation, interrogation, prosecution, uh, is kind of, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's this this uh, uh, pressure uh, to expedite it, which I find uh, somewhat, uh, you know, ironic because uh, these things take time, uh, especially if, if uh, the police is required to operate uh, in a way which, which uh, sort of syncs with the concept of modern policing. Uh, and SSP uh, Temu talked about the, the colonial past. Uh, we know that uh, this, uh, under the uh, 1861 Police Act, it was essentially the Irish constabulary model. In Ireland, they were called the Black and Tans. And uh, again, ironically, the uh, initial police uniform was exactly the Black and Tans here also. But interestingly, and this is a point that I want to focus on at, uh, at this moment for IG Yunus, that even during those colonial times, the British residency towns, uh, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, uh, they had the same kind of Met Police uh, you know, model uh, as, uh, as in London. Uh, the rest of it was, of course, very different. Now, as I said in my introduction, there have been a, lots of debates with reference to that. India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka uh, have gone on. Uh, to have met policing model, whereas in Pakistan, we have not managed that so far. Now, do you think, I.G. Yunus, that that is something that would, A, kind of uh, appreciate the difference between urban policing, especially, uh, you know, policing in, in larger uh, metropolises and rural policing? And would that have some kind of salutary impact on how the police operates uh, when it is interfacing with the citizens? Uh, sir, thank you very much. Essentially, this model of policing all across Pakistan is a rural model. Even if you go to police station Gurberg 
of Lahore, you will see that Lahore. settings are now much different. Now we have developed a front desk, we have developed camera led uh, with, with the cameras, fully camera led policing, we have cameras all around, we have cameras in the lockups. But whenever you enter the room of an IO investigation officer, you will find his uh, charpai and his table together. And he will be wearing most of the time a rule clothing. So the essential, the spirit of policing is essentially rural. Mm. And even uh, I must say and confess that even the police order who is not able to get us out of that. The writing of case. Uh, now we are after this digitalization and much computerization we have seen a difference now we are starting uh, a new journey but obviously it will take some more time like uh, to really believe that yes we have changed we have like put that rule model in the past but i i, I fully agree with you that uh, in our system there is no differentiation between rural and the urban models while even in Islamabad, the police station Tarnol or Baraka and the police station Kosar, which is F7, F6 area, are working almost on a similar fashion. So the point which you have raised is essential. It it should it should have an impact. But I also I want to emphasize one point that uh, uh, we the police leadership and our all uh, uh, police officers tend to find the reform process always in getting new laws and such. Uh, whether I think that there is a lot we can change at our own as well. So I think a hybrid approach of both can ultimately help. Just getting new laws will, won't help. It is the essential change management or the leadership which, uh, which, which like trusts the change, which can bring the change, which follows the change will ultimately be able to make some headway in this regard, sir. That's, that's an excellent point. And I think one of the reasons I invited uh, uh, both of you was to get your perspective. Uh, I also believe that even in terms of legislation, there is, uh, uh, you know, it's important to get the perspective of the police officers also because you are the practitioners. And as I said, policing is very delicate in the sense that on the one hand, it's about service. On the other hand, it's about enforcement and, and you know, bringing these two, to, uh, two things together uh, in, in, in a combination that allows you effective enforcement uh, without uh, sort of reducing the service aspect of it is something which is very delicate. And I think, you know, as experienced police officers, it's important for you to give your input in the legislation process. But since um, IG Yunus talked about uh, changes, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the police side. Uh, let me uh, ask you, um, SSP Tamur. there is a, among other things, I mean, I, I'm just giving an example. Uh, there are obviously, uh, there are other ways of reforming this and I would, uh, you know, uh, request your views on that. But here is a simple expedient. If, if the investigation rooms have cameras, if the investigation officer before starting the investigation says i am so and so i have su suspect name so and so uh, this is the case uh, for which i am investigating this uh, this person and the investigation begins <coughs> at 10 hundred hours uh, all of this is recorded and once the investigation uh, ends he again notifies that the investigation with suspect xyz uh, reference case ABC has ended for now. Now, if it is made imperative for every precinct that every investigation will be thus recorded, it seems to me that the possibility of uh, torture will be greatly reduced. And in the event that a particular precinct cannot produce the recorded tape of an investigation, then it can also become the basis for prosecuting those police officers against whom there might be a complaint. 
Um, yes, I, I think that you have really um, hit the nail on the head by saying that uh, the requirement for a standard investigation room is a must. But uh, if deplorably, I must uh, confess to this fact that we have not been able to come up with standard investigation rooms as yet in our, our uh, police stations, even in the ones which are in big urban centers. Now, uh, the one that you are indicating is uh, that of a uh, standardized investigation room, which has uh, standard operating procedures with it and a method of investigation to go with it. Now, this is the long and short of it. Uh, if you go beyond that, the thing that um, even Essen indicated that, that we need to have a, a, a mechanism actually the, the police there at our own level and one of those things that can be done at the police station level is to equip uh, your police officers the investigators with, with skills uh, now those skills essentially are soft skills and hardcore police skills both and traditional they um, of uh, police uh, in the developed world did um, almost uh, half a century back. Also, the same method that we use here uh, in Pakistan in 2022. Um, so they also started with uh, the sort of um, going, um, taking law into their hands and uh, using third degree methods. But really, even though, despite the fact that we use uh, torture, uh, third degree torture methods, uh, despite the rate of conviction, so what goes on to say is basic 14 uh, days investigation are positive that if we equip our investigators with the techniques and methods, which are modern, just like the, the forensics part of it, just like the science and technology part of it, the IT part of it, if we equip them, uh, like we use a lot of uh, uh, CDRs and geofencing and a lot of technology, uh, what we call the technology-led policing, if the investigator is equipped with such methods, I'm sure that uh, he or she will also uh, is less likely to feel the need for employing torture, uh, because I believe that a person, uh, any person who enters the police station, uh, whether as uh, an innocent person or actually someone that there is ocular evidence that they committed a crime, but still uh, they they feel that um, within the bounds of the police station, um, they do not have any outside external help because we do not have uh, legal advisors like we have in the developed uh, part of the world. So having said that, what uh, I mean to say is that um, the person who is being interrogated or interviewed in the police station is already um, at a weaker position. So uh, while they are already at a weaker position and they are being interviewed or, and interrogated by the police, um, it is uh, very necessary to equip the investigator with uh, proper modern investigating techniques so that uh, not only um, it is helpful in the according of the statements, but the corroboration of evidence, because now we have other sister agencies working uh, in collaboration with police for processing the evidence. And then uh, there is the whole process of not only the collection, but the corroboration. And then just because we have an adversarial law uh, system that we follow here in the criminal justice. So, you know, um, basically, we can always find the gaps which we can fill in and if we try to fill in the smaller gaps we should be able to come up with a system uh, because uh, we have uh, tried and tested this uh, system of torture for the last seven decades and, and unfortunately it hasn't worked out so uh, even if uh, somebody thinks that it was the right way to do it uh, the statistics uh, actually uh, go against uh, uh, the normal perception so i think that uh, Going with the modern uh, techniques of investigation is actually the way forward. And like you said, that we need to have a modern investigation rooms with the audio video recordings and also uh, the standard procedures to go with it. Not a, It's not a, a matter of the steel and concrete that is going to go into the investigation room. It is actually the training and the mechanism, the procedure, uh, the laws that are going to basically be at the back end. Absolutely. Excellent point. So, so here's the thing. Uh, clearly, the senior officers, uh, police officers, uh, and two of them are with me. Uh, sir, may, uh, I, may, may I interject a bit in it, sir? Sorry. Gigi, please go ahead. G. Asin sir, go ahead. Sir, there is a very nice term known as creative compliance. Uh, sir, can you hear me, sir? G. I can hear you. 
okay so there is a term known as creative compliance and we and we we are as a nation are very good in creative compliance uh, you know you won't find any torture in any law similarly you won't find much of an issue in any front desk where cameras were put in we have tried this by putting interrogation rooms which were with having a cameras and we have also put cameras audio visual cameras in uh, some uh, inter, uh, investigation and inquiry rooms as well unfortunately the term creative compliance no torture or no bad thing will happen before the camera so you have to like put the whole scenario in focus that the people are pretty smart enough that they will not be doing anything illegal before camera so that is not the perhaps the whole solution so the problem which policing and the investigation is facing is much more than just putting the cameras around at this no, moment so there is no function so, so, specialization so, so, so. right when we have uh, like uh, so. no no go ahead Please. go ahead so so my point is that there is an investigation officer who is uh, because the previous old beat model is still working that all the crimes happening in this beat number 1 will be investigating by mr si falana and there is one asi with him both these two will be the beat investigation officers and all those cases happening in that beat regardless of the fact that one cases of uh, a sexual violence and other cases of a murder and other cases of a dequality then there is a 489f of check fraud so this is leading us to nowhere and io is dealing with the uh, check fraud and at the very same time he is taking care of sexual violence as well so it is not leading us to anywhere it is not contributing to the capacity of investigation officer it is not leading to better conviction and it is not leading to the good investigation as well what we have suggested that we have divided investigation in largely four to five different functions because all the crime against property meaning by robbery dequality is headed should be done by separate squads all the homicide should have a separate squad all the fraud and forgery should have a separate squad so people improve themselves learn the learn the techniques of good investigation and present good cases before courts and uh, believe me when you do it i have partially done this uh, in rawalpindi and now we are trying it to do in islamabad as well but you have a pretty good conviction in homicide cases we have a pretty good conviction some in narcotics cases because we have designated ios investigation officers for those uh, specific offenses so it is not only just putting cameras it is also making proper functional specialization in investigation equipping the equipping the io uh, making him or her more uh, uh, professional by training and all that thing they will and then the cameras this will all make a whole solution it is just putting cameras is not the whole answer no, i i completely agree with you uh, let me just explain that uh, the uh, the expedient of having the cameras was just simply an example of how things can be tackled obviously cameras in and of themselves unless you change the culture unless you change the approach uh, unless you reorganize the entire thing and i completely agree with you that you need to have specialization and sub specializations uh, and and this is not rocket science i mean there are best practices across the world and uh, we can always pick them up we don't really have to reinvent the wheel um i'm also very happy i mean i think that is the essence of the program the session very happy that the police officers the police leadership is cognizant of the problem of torture is also uh, uh, convinced that this is something that needs to go uh, ssp uh, tamur very rightly said that uh, you know it doesn't statistics do not show that uh, resorting to torture uh, is automatically going to uh, be effective as far as prosecution is concerned we actually saw this i mean there are a number of studies now in the us and in the west with reference to what uh, euphemistically 
was referred to uh, as enhanced interrogation techniques during the so-called war on terror. Uh, they did not really bear fruit. Um, and so, so you know, so there, there is empirical evidence also, and there is conceptual evidence also that it doesn't really work. And I think forensics, the focus on professionalism, uh, the the ability to to uh, you know perform their duties professionally are more important. But here's the thing, and uh, I uh, let let me let me uh, uh, you know make a comparison. Uh, not in terms of functioning, but in terms of creating a professional medium. The army also gets its recruitment from the same areas as the police does. Uh, and then whether it's for the officer cadre, which goes to the Pakistan Military Academy, or to various centers where the soldiers are initially trained, a median level of professionalism is created. So every task has check boxes. And so once you are, whether a patrol car is stopping someone, those people must know the number of boxes they, they have to check, whether someone is being investigated, the investigating officer needs to know what boxes he has to check and in what way. So this is one thing uh, which I'll take to SSP Tamur. And the other thing has to do with the two tiers of policing here in Pakistan. You belong to the upper tier. You belong to the police service of Pakistan, which is a federal service. The actual interface of the citizen happens with the provincial cadres. Uh, there is a very clear difference in terms of education, socioeconomic backgrounds of these two tiers. And so there needs to be, and one of the reasons I talked about the difference between urban and rural policing, and I talked about uh, MET policing uh, models, uh, is there need to understand this? to also conceptualize this as part of legislating and criminalizing torture, and also for the police itself on its part to do certain things, to write a position paper and say to the government, this is these are the things that we face, and these are the things that you must incorporate in terms of reforming the force. Um, first of all, I would uh, resort to the point that you made on um, the different SOPs that are in place. And uh, definitely there is no shortcut to uh, having a proper procedure because uh, in uh, when it comes to penalizing uh, the different investigators or for that matter, other human resource, it is actually a challenge for the supervisory officers because if we want to penalize them for something that, uh, that they did wrong, we actually do not have a list of things how to do them. Uh, and uh, I, as a supervisory le level officer, I feel it uh, very challenging so that if I have to penalize the officer for a wrongdoing, I really need to have a checklist with me already uh, from which I can tell him or guide him at least so that the whole process of uh, uh, penalizing and punishment, reward and punishment does not uh, spiral down to just a few show cause notices or something uh, that he should uh, remember that he was penalized for something. Actually, the uh, punishment is for them to learn. So I am uh, a very ardent uh, proponent of uh, having such checklist, even if the checklist is not exhaustive, even if it just uh, it has just four to five check boxes, it is absolutely understandable and much more doable by our junior ranking officers who are actually at the technical level. And in, uh, consequently, it also becomes easier for the supervisory officers to uh, guide them and then steer them. The post correction can only be done when uh, there are certain things already there in black and white. And that is the difference uh, between us. I will just quote an example, just a little tra transgression. Uh, the way raids are conducted in the British police, um, they have a proper mechanism of putting everything in black and white. And that is why in collateral damage, when they lose their men, in the police force, there are uh, no inquiries held in the way that we uh, exercise here because everything is there in black and white, their homework is done. And if there are any mistakes or gaps found out, 
in the operation at the tactical level, you can always go back in reverse engineering and you can actually find out what you did wrong or what was wrong in the manner that you conducted the raid. Um, so this is just a very small example. And if uh, we compare it to the operations that uh, we do here, I think that we still are a far cry from um, what uh, we, we should be futuristically doing at the tactical level and then at the operational and uh, ultimately at the policy level. Um, secondly, um, you talked about the differences in the two tiers. Um, I am uh, also a uh, a big supporter of uh, the leadership models and uh, i have done both uh, urban policing and rural policing and i've seen that if the supervisory officer if the officer in command and in charge is very clear about human rights violations about torture about vulnerable groups if he's sensitized and they uh, show a clear tilt it's not something in a very lukewarm manner but they show their priority uh, for the weaker in position i have seen that our human resource is uh, astounding and this sort of um, uh, the sort of followers that they become they see that if there is will in the leadership they always follow that course and in that way i must admire our junior ranks that despite the very challenging conditions that they work in despite the lack of resources and the lack of support that um, they uh, their counterparts get in the armed forces i think they are doing a good job but i think it's uh, basically um, the gap is more at the leadership level and like um, you've seen like uh, uh, respected ID Islamabad has shared with you that they are going towards specialization of units and making such small changes and taking such small steps is actually the way forward uh, for reforming the police. Excellent points. Um, on this uh, tactical side rates that you mentioned, uh, just a segue, uh, I have uh, long held that uh, a uh, police uh, should not have assault rifles, especially in the urban environment. They should be trained uh, to use uh, sidearms. Uh, I've also seen some of the elite units train, and uh, I must say that uh, the standard of training needs to improve drastically. Uh, but uh, here's the thing, IG uh, units. Uh, I think this was back in 2017. I was at the Central Police Office uh, in, in Lahore. And we were being given a briefing. And so as per that briefing, the Bennett strength of Punjab police was 186,000, out of which 125,000 were constables, uh, essentially for watch and ward functions with zero policing skills in terms of any skill set, whether it's investigation, whether it's... And even in watch and ward, uh, you know, uh, there are a number of uh, loopholes. So... Do you believe that there needs to be a greater percentage of budgets going into police training, especially of the cadres with which the citizens are going to interface? Thank you, Jasa. Very good question. This is the thing which uh, perhaps uh, uh, taking all of my focus nowadays that in our training curriculum officers do not believe in that training this is very interesting allow me to use this sentence in urdu ke sir field mein jo padhaya jata hai aisa field mein nahi hota so my in, in, in my, my understanding this is our first and foremost tasks to make them believe that whatever is being taught is correct so this is most important thing that because until unless you believe in your training and you believe that this is the training which is imparted to you with an ambition to practice this training in the field this is very important because that's why I, I am now I'm an ardent uh, believer that now we should be taking all the correct case studies in our training. We should be asking our trainer, trainees to go to police station, find the case, come back, so that uh, we come up the, with the gap which we they uh, feel or allege that aisa to field mein nahi hota. Isse we need to come out of this one. It is most important that, they, you know, for any change, for anything, there is no shortcut to train. One. Two. 
as the new york model of breton went make commanders responsible for the deeds of their subordinates this is also very important after training then as uh, madam maria had rightly indicated about the checklist and all that uh, i i want to like put this on record that uh, with uh, sir mohammed ali nekukara's input and his advice we had developed a discipline matrix for punjab police and it is being followed at this moment so that there there are certain standards of punishment there are there is a conduct which is um, or misconduct which is defined well i will request you to go through that document it is a, uh, an exhaustive document and at the very same time we have developed our case files as well for every specific crime there are checklists for every specific crime and we have distributed into multi colors so there are like 10 different color files which deal with specific uh, crimes so that io is uh, able to check make the checklist and so and his supervisor uh, while fully supporting your idea and uh, of saying i think this is the foremost uh, of foremost importance that we make our training a fresh then uh, right uh, there are a number of issues one can go on it's a, it's a uh, you know very expansive uh, topic but uh, since we have paucity of time let me ask both of you uh, starting with the uh, ssp tamur uh since I, i believe there is a consensus here that you know torture is a problem and that it needs to be uh, eradicated and it needs to be criminalized uh if you were asked ssp tamur if you were asked for your input and i know i mean i I'm, i'm asking you uh, to sort of you know uh, uh, uh capsule this this thing and it's difficult because there's so many complex issues but if you were asked your input by the legislators uh if you were to brief a uh, committee or subcommittee of parliament on this what would be the three or four salient points that you would present to them um i think that uh, this is something um uh, that uh, there is um absolutely uh, consensus even at the leadership level of the police and also uh, in the supervisory ranks and then the junior ranks that uh torture is something that we resort to just because we do not have any alternate methods so probably the first suggestion that i would volunteer to make would be that um i can probably come up with a presentation or talking about all the different alternate methods and then the procedures mechanisms to support them uh secondly um the different uh, uh i think the, just because we keep on and we don't say it much that police is all, always a reflection of the society that we police um so uh, when uh, as police officers we are uh, sitting in our offices or whether in the field operations um the uh, expectations of uh, the public from the police are uh, very hyperbolic and uh, they expect the police to indulge in uh, unjust practices um and uh, from um, your own experience of being a journalist and covering so many different diverse sections of the society uh, at least on the urban side you must be knowledge of the fact that uh whoever is aggrieved um both of the parties who approach the police basically wants the police to indulge in human rights violations uh, or anything of, of the sort with the other party which uh, they uh, who their opponent is so i think uh, th there are um, mechanisms which uh, you know at the societal level we need to um, address those societal factors and uh, it it must be done through alternate means of media social media and um at, at other education probably reach out programs where the society needs to learn that to uphold the law you must be a law abiding citizen and just because the police thinks that um injustice has be, has been done to you and they are standing on your side does not mean that you are in a position to oppress your opponent even if they they are the uh, accused and they will be because there is a, a due process of law which has to be fo followed so i think that uh, the second um Uh, thing i would request from the such committee would be to um come up with uh, a group of uh, stakeholders where they can identify such social behaviors which are actually exhibited in the behavior of the police 
Right. Uh, do we still have uh, Asan Saab with us? Uh, Asan Saab could probably, if there is a connection problem, you could, yeah, okay, we got him back. Uh, so, Asan Saab, uh, any salient points with reference to if you were asked to uh, brief a committee of parliament? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Asan Saab? I think you have your mic muted. Yeah, I think I think we have lost connection with uh, Asan Yunus Saab again. Uh, but thank you so much. I think uh, this is this is just the beginning, and I'm really grateful to uh, uh, to IG uh, Asan Yunus. Uh, also very grateful to SSP Maria Tamur for their input. Uh, this is, as you can see, a very important uh, issue. Uh, it also is, in some ways, a class issue. Uh, well, I think we've got uh, IG Yunus back again. Can you hear me, Asan Saab? You can't hear me? Uh, SSB Tamur, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So I don't know. I think there is a... Uh, you know, sir, why don't you switch off your video? Maybe your connection is kind of unstable. If you switch off your video, you might be able to hear me. Just use the audio. Can you do that? Okay, the sound is lost. I just got uh, Unisav's message. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, both uh, the guest officers. And I think uh, we'll have a more occasion, perhaps uh, in person, a round table or something at some point uh, to talk about these issues. Uh, there is clear consensus. And as uh, both the officers said, that there is uh, the police leadership itself is cognizant of uh, the imperative of uh, eradicating these practices through a number of measures, uh, better training, uh, better, uh, you know, specializations, uh, better reorganization, better infrastructure in terms of having dedicated investigation rooms. Um, I remember some years ago, I was talking to uh, IG Shoka Javed Saab during one of my programs and he actually talked about the fact that instead of having too many precincts spread across, uh, and he was talking about Lahore, but you know the solution was not just for Lahore, that instead of having too many precincts, uh, we should have a less number of purpose-built buildings. Uh, and and you know, so, so that we have different um, areas within the building uh, which will deal with different types of crimes and complaints, something that IG Yunus was also talking about. So anyway, uh, for this evening, I will thank uh, my guest officers once again. Uh, and inshallah, we will be talking uh, to them and others also in the near future. Thank you and khudafiz. Thank you.